All right, so next up uh, we have um, Jeff Walsh, Chief Financial and Strategy Officer at Bluebird Bio. Jeff. Great. Everybody see the shoes? I like that. He's got the... Nah, yeah, I thought it was going to rain. Sure. Looks good. Uh, hi, everybody, and uh, certainly excited to be here. Um, it's, it's fun to see the energy in the room around, uh, around ARM and, and what's going on in ARM. So that's, uh, that's, that's wonderful to see and certainly uh, delighted to be here just to give a few comments on, on Bluebird. I will be making some forward-looking statements, uh, so please uh, reference our ACC filings for further information on the, the risks associated with the company. Um, we're an organization that um, we always start with this slide for, for good reason, and that's that we bring uh, patients into the company on a very regular basis to, to really understand the plight of, of, the, the, of their lives and their families and, and to really understand why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and you see some of the faces here um, that bring stories to mind uh, and stories that we hear every day from uh, one young boy who had ALD who didn't survive um, and we've gotten to know his, his family. And that continues to drive us day in, day out to, to, uh, to ultimately succeed. Um, it's our people, however, that, that also are our focus. And, and building a team that really is dedicated to this and where leadership is paramount to, to what we do every day is, is equally as, as important. I'll come to that um, certainly in the end. We put out a pretty bold uh, vision for the company at uh, J.P. Morgan this year. And it's represented here, the plan to, by 2022, have at least two products on the market, to have at least two products approaching commercialization, and to have more, four more products uh, in the clinic, with the expectation and the full expectation that these will not be merely Me Too type products or even incremental improvements to what exists in, in, in the market today, but truly transformative therapies that have a dramatic effect on the lives of the patients I just described. Um, and I think we're making tremendous progress toward that vision with the, the hope that we can make a dramatic impact um, on the patients we uh, desperately seek to serve. This really just represents uh, kind of the, how, how we view the building of the company over time, uh, anchored in the center on two f uh, franchises or platforms around severe genetic diseases and around immunotherapy, targeting two different cell types, anchored in our uh, historic capability in um, inserting DNA into a cell type, leveraging uh, lentiviral vectors. Um, but we've built upon that. We've built in terms of global capabilities now, uh, particularly US and Europe, and then our gene editing platform, which is making some great progress. But we've built around that. Um, that used to be the, the, the end of the story in terms of relaying who we are and what we're trying to do. But now we've got some tremendous clinical experience uh, with four products in the clinic, a pipeline behind that. Uh, and a lot of uh, knowledge that we've gained that is educating us uh, and our team of 350 uh, strong now in, in uh, Cambridge, in Seattle, and, and now sprinkled throughout Europe. So this has led to, to the pipeline that you see here uh, today. We've got um, certainly our uh, programs that are targeting hematopoietic stem cells on the top, um, Lenti D, and our thalassemia programs are, are the most advanced in uh, phase three trials. We've got our sickle cell program behind that that is in a phase one, two. And then we have our partnered program with Celgene uh, targeting BCMA for multiple myeloma. This is our CAR-T program targeting T-cells uh, and an emerging pipeline behind that anchored in a few deals that we've done as well as our gene editing uh, technology. It's um, really predicated on a lot of partnerships you see down below. I'm not going to go through them, but we can't do this alone. We realize that there's a huge hill that we're trying to climb. And We've got some wonderful, wonderful partners, both academics as well as uh, commercial entities that, that we're working with uh, day in, day out. Um, that's a great, we think, pipeline um, slide to be shown, um, but it's really anchored in a lot of work that has taken place over the last uh, decade, and it's really geared toward an evolution of products, and uh, I think we're going to see some of that coming out in the clinic this year. And you see that we're not stopping at version one. For a lentiglobin product, we have a version two that's going to read out this year. For our BCMA program, we're going to enter the clinic with a second generation BCMA program. That's characteristic of our entire pipeline, and ultimately hope it's going to translate to a very deep and rich pipeline over the long term, leveraging the toolbox that we've accumulated as represented by that product engine uh, component in the middle. So how do we get there? I'm going to put this whole slide up. 
uh, and then try and end there. Um, first and foremost, we've got a fair amount of cash to, to run at this, which is always a wonderful thing. Um, so close to 900 million at the end of the year still in the, in the bank to, to run at this. But the one thing I want to point out here on this slide is we have two things happening this year. One is we're reading out two clinical programs that will really dictate the timeline and speed and confidence for moving toward uh, registration filing on two programs, that's ALD and thalassemia. And we have a readout of two other clinical programs that are going to dictate the timeline to phase threes. So uh, an incredibly data-rich year for the company starting at ASCO in June, and then it's going gonna, it's gonna to roll out through the second half of the year on the other programs. We are starting two other clinical programs this year, some of I described before, um, our 212 trial, and then our next generation BCMA program. Uh, and lots of lots of interaction with regulatory authorities, as you can imagine, with that type of a, of a year coming forward. Um, it ends with the team back in, in Cambridge and Seattle and, and, and Europe, for sure, um, where we really are dedicated to being truly humble um, and humbled by some of the things we hear from our patients, but really trying to be authentic and build a culture that really is for the future uh, that we can build upon. So um, I'll end the, the, the prepared remarks and look forward to Josh, your comments. Uh, terrific overview. Um, maybe we can start in the upper left hexagon <laughs> of the previous. No, it's okay. The uh, the CAR T uh, the CAR T myeloma uh, update. If if we can if we can. Um, perfect. The the upper left hexagon. So I, I get a lot of questions about um, you know what we should expect at ASCO. Maybe before you know addressing that, tell us what you've shown to date and, and what we should have our eyes out for at the next data presentation. Sure. So um, obviously this partner, this is a program that's partnered with Celgene, and so we are working uh, uh, collaboratively with them um, uh, in the BCMA program. So what, what we've disclosed to date, so out of the triple meeting last year, right before ASH, we presented the first data from our 2121 asset in the clinic targeting relapse refractively uh, multiple myeloma, and these patients had an average of uh, six failed therapies before ranging from five to 13. So these were, these were uh, patients that were obviously in a lot of, uh, a lot of trouble. And uh, we were able to show nine patients who had a valuable data across three different dose cohorts, starting at 50 million cells, going to 150, and then ultimately to 450 million cells. Um, the first three patients, um, uh, it was a low dose. We expected that it might be subtherapeutic, but we didn't know. It turns out that it was subtherapeutic. Um, but at the second dose, which was really uh, a good thing to see, we saw some quite uh, interesting responses, including two uh, complete responses and one very good uh, partial response. Um, and that was out. The latest patient had six months of follow-up, and I believe that was one of the CRs. And then at the next dose cohort at 450, relatively early data, but we saw responses in all three of those patients. So of the six patients that um, were uh, uh, valuable and at a dose level that we started to see response, we had uh, all of those patients responding. Data's early. We, we saw data from three months to six months or two months to six months. But at ASCO, we will get six months more of data on each of those patients. We had also disclosed that we had uh, treated two other patients at the 800, so we'll see six months uh, at least on, on those, well, six months on those, and then any others that we have dosed in this three plus three uh, clinical trial design. Um, uh, an area of, of key focus now for investors with the CAR-T platform is who will be administering these? Are these part of the transplant uh, Tologist toolkit, or are these products that can actually jump in front of the transplant and be done at maybe the academic center, not, not necessarily the quaternary referral transplant center. What, what are your thoughts and expectations for how the field may evolve and who's going to be administering these? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really good question, and I think a lot of this is going to be predicated on how the data ultimately play themselves out, both from an efficacy standpoint um, and a safety standpoint as to exactly where in the lines of therapy this will ultimately be, be used. Um, certainly, as is kind of classic for these type of therapies, it will be the, uh, the transplant centers that, that, that start and, and experience it, it first, and that's certainly our expectation. And if the data certainly warranted and the experience uh, in, in the market warranted, it, it, there's a possibility 
of, of certainly uh, uh, moving moving in a different direction. The the one thing that that will dictate that I think is the safety of this this asset. Um, and I, I know you know the the safety profile, but we had some very good promising early. Uh, indication that, that this might have a slightly different safety profile than some of the other CAR-T programs out there, uh, uh, albeit early data, and we need to read that out further, but we did not see any, despite the, the efficacy, did not see any grade three or grade four CRS, nor any uh, grade three or grade four neurotoxicity that has been seen with some of the our other CAR-T uh, programs. Um, so that was encouraging. If that continues or something close to that, we can consider other um, applications is beyond just the relapse refractory, but that's where we're focused initially. And, and what are the key differences that may explain that difference in tolerability? I wish we could say we know. The, the, the frank answer is we don't really fully understand. We have some hypotheses on what could be causing that or could be resulting in uh, a, a slightly better or, or, or better safety profile. They are, um, you know, certainly look at the SCFV. Um, it certainly could confer some advantages. Uh, the co-stimulatory co domain, we're using 41BB. That may have uh, an impact here. We uh, intentionally chose a product that had low tonic signaling, um, which means that uh, without the presence of antigen, the T cells are not activated or not fully activated. That may, may explain some. Our, just our manufacturing process alone, each of the organizations has a little bit of a different way of approaching manufacturing and processing of cells. Could that have an impact? Quite possibly. But, but I, I think anybody that really says they, they know is not, um, is not being true to the field that's just emerging where, we'll, where we continue to learn. For the Lenti Globin product profile, um, I think the, the process changes that you've made have been pretty well communicated and, and really an, an impressive scientific effort to, to optimize the, the platform there. Maybe take us through the next year and, and what milestones we'll get from that program in both beta thal and sickle. So on beta thalassemia, just to speak to the process changes that, that we made, which is slightly different in sickle cell, for the thalassemia program, uh, we implemented a process change that incorporated two small molecules into the uh, transduction step where the uh, viral vector is attempting to insert the DNA into the, the cells that we've collected from the patients. That has shown uh, at least uh, preclinically to confer an advantage of having more of the cells be receptive to, a, to an insertion of, of that DNA being carried by the viral vector. That should result in a higher uh, vector copy number, which should result in higher levels of um, functioning hemoglobin. And that's what we need to show um, in the clinic. We will give the first inclination of that at EHA, EHA, in June, following ASCO, two weeks after ASCO. Um, we'll have a few patients. We, we dosed the first patient with the new manufacturing process in December of last year, so we'll see five or six months worth of data on, on that patient, which should give us a good indication of how well that process has uh, translated to clinical benefit. The one early indication we do have that we've publicly announced is that uh, the first patient that we treated with this new process generated a vector copy number of 2.9. Uh, prior to that, we had not seen anything over 2.1, and so, and that patient that had a 2.1 vector copy number is doing quite well. I think they're producing the last data we disclosed, 13 and a half grams per deciliter, which is effectively normal levels of, of hemoglobin. That ultimately is, is the, uh, the goal. I don't know that it's the goal from a regulatory process, but for the patient, that, that ultimately is the goal. On sickle cell, it's a bit different. It's more complicated disease where we don't think just potency of, of the, the product uh, is going to ultimately be the only thing that's needed. Uh, and there are a number of things that we, as you know, that we're working on there, including making sure that the myoblation goes well, uh, making sure that these patients' uh, bone marrow are quieted um, prior to the administration of the therapy because they have a hypoxic uh, bone marrow that may uh, contribute to um, some of the things we've seen in the clinic that didn't result in, in, in positive results in, in those patients, at least with the early data. So we believe that uh, transfusions for two months prior to therapy may allow that bone marrow that is really uh, um, geared up when, when it's trying to produce lots of uh, red blood cells to quiet that, that environment. 
Um, we have n implemented some new manufacturing steps to increase the cell yield, so more cells we believe are, is better. Um, so we think that these type of changes, there are a couple more, um, will allow us across the spectrum of, of the, the patient's care to be able to deliver a higher level of transduced cells and be able to have those cells engrafted, and that's, that's the goal. High level of transduced cells engrafted in these patients, which should allow us to get to more of the 204-like outcomes that we saw uh, in, the, in the New England Journal uh, article and the patient that was described there, which was uh, arguably uh, uh, um, you know, a, a good success so far for that patient. Let's see if there's any quick question in the audience. Yeah, Dimitri. said there's sorry uh, thinking about ASCO what should we focus on when you guys present the poster I know there's a competitor data set out there that's gonna I think it's from some Chinese company I'm not familiar with uh, maybe you could sort of help us frame how we should compare both data sets again knowing that nobody really knows what the other company is going to present right um, I can't speak to the other uh, organizations data I think that was a surprise to a lot of folks to see see that data uh, even though it hasn't been fully disclosed yet, for sure. Um, what I can say is what you should look for in, in, in our data. And there's a couple things. One, certainly durability. We'll have a patient out close to a year uh, at that point at, at ASCO, and a, num a couple of patients out nine, ten months um, as well. So you'll get a good sense of whether that, um, th that persisted, the, the, the response persisted or not. You'll have another set of patients that are going to be out six, seven months as well from the, the 450 cohort. Um, we also will be presenting data looking at both high tumor burden, low tumor burden. Um, we don't know whether that is meaningful or not, but and we certainly have, have treated patients in, in the data you've seen publicly to date, but we're trying to, to, to tease that out as well. So that, that's something I would uh, certainly look for. And, and certainly the last is, do, does our safety profile continue to, to hold even close to what we've seen? which we're excited about, and I think the field is excited about, does it continue to hold? And uh, if it does, and we continue to see efficacy, um, that clearly is somewhat of a different profile of a, of a CAR-T product than we've seen before. But that's what you should, I think we should be looking to see if, if those things continue to, to, to persist. Do you show no persistence? We'll show all the data that we have disclosed in the, in the past, and read out all of those, those patients, whether it's exactly going to be in the poster, uh, I don't know, but we'll make that, those type of data, supporting data, uh, publicly available. Yeah, I can't speak to what's exactly going to be in the poster because I don't, I don't know, but we'll, we'll give all the supporting data as well, as much as we have. Let's take a coffee break and come back at around 3.15 for the immuno-oncology panel. Jeff, thank you so much. Thanks.